Ho, 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 you freaks. <laughs> uh, sorry to scare you like that. Uh, happy holidays, everybody. It's cold out here. I'm trying to moisturize. Can't forget to do that. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, uh, today I'm going to be giving you guys a little tour of uh, New York and explain to you how New York helped kind of invent the concept of Christmas that we know today. And I know it's a little clickbaity, okay, but I could have named it something worse. It could have been something like, you know, top nine epic reasons why New York destroys college student at cat fail rally. You know what I mean? So look, the, the fact of the matter is New York helped create the concept of what we know as Christmas today. Uh, and, uh, you know, gonna be a pretty cool little video. Before we start, uh, check out the Patreon. There's some extras on there. You help fund these things, huh? You know, you can go in there for some extra content. <laughs> You know, uh, it sounds a little creepy, I know, but uh, that's not what I meant. Uh, also, too, helps you know, keep me from having to hawk vitamin supplements and stuff, so that's always good. And uh, yeah, so check that out. Also, too, subscribe to the subscribe to the channel. I know you've watched more than one of these things, so go ahead, subscribe, and also to like the video. Just give it a thumbs up. Helps with the old analytics, as all the tech heads uh, tell me. Anyways, uh, yeah, that's pretty much the business of it. So we're going to go around the city today and talk about all this stuff. Eric, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Happy holidays, you son of a gun. Me too. Yeah, what are you asking for, uh, what are you asking for from Santa this year? Uh, get a bit warmer. Get a bit warmer. It is cold. It is cold. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to be drinking eggnog and, and uh, singing Christmas carols today. So don't worry. What the hell am I talking about? All right. Um, what, do you th what do you say we get started with this thing? Let's do it. Well, look at that. I'm here at the beginning of Broadway, actually, to tell you how the early colonies, uh, the early colony of New Amsterdam, helped create the initial idea of what we know as Christmas here. Uh, before I start, we're actually next to the Charging Bowl of Wall Street, which interestingly enough, was a Christmas gift from the artist Arturo de Monica in 1989. It was left under the tree in front of the New York Stock Exchange as a gift to the Stock Exchange, uh, and they were going to throw it away. And in fact, the newspapers reported on it, and people got so interested in it that they said, all right, the city said fine. And so they put it here at the beginning of Broadway, and it's become a tradition ever since. But that's beside the point. I'm here to tell you about how Dutch New Amsterdam kind of helped create Christmas here in New York. Think of Christmas here in the United States as kind of the, the, the combination of two holidays. So you have December 6th was the Feast of St. Nicholas where St. Nicholas would leave you gifts and your shoes which you left outside or stockings hung above the chimney, uh, whatever, all that stuff. And you also had Christmas, which traditionally uh, they celebrated since the Roman times. Uh, and what, what they did was it used to actually be the celebration of the winter solstice. The Romans would celebrate it. It was like a real big like party because, you know, there wasn't going to be a lot to do. That was like at the peak of all the, the meat being slaughtered, all that stuff. So there's just huge parties, like very, it was like a bacchanal, if you will. Yeah, that's a nice little SAT word. And in fact, the, the Catholic Church under Constantine kind of co-opted it and started to celebrate Jesus' birthday around that time, even though, historically speaking, it probably wasn't around that time. They started to celebrate it there to kind of co-opt it from the pagans, right? So it, it dates back a long time. So here in the colonies, you kind of had these two holidays competing around December time, right? You had the Dutch who were here celebrating their fun holiday of, of uh, you know, presents and kids getting presents in their stockings, all that stuff's great. Then you had Christmas, which was actually looked at, uh, you know, kind of uh, negatively by, by some of the colonists, like the Puritans and the Calvinists. They actually outlawed Christmas in um, the Massachusetts colony uh, for a little bit. So there were two very different holidays. And slowly, the people who celebrated Christmas started to see the traditions of the Feast of St. Nicholas and be like, oh, it's kind of cool, man. I want to get presents. Oh, this is great. Mommy, Daddy, I want to celebrate the Feast of St. Nicholas. And slowly, those kind of traditions started to be pulled in. After the War of Independence, which the United States won, no big deal, no hard feelings there, Britain. Then the United States started, the new United States wanted to pull away from British traditions and things like that. In fact, they renamed Columbia University uh, from King's College. Uh, they, they renamed the streets, all those kinds of things. And in, in addition, they started to promote some of the traditions and things associated with the Feast of St. Nicholas rather than those of Christmas. And they slowly started to meld together. Look at that. Uh, the St. Nicholas, or, or, or as the Dutch pronounced it, uh, Sinterklaas. Sinterklaas, St. Nicholas. It's a pretty good uh, Dutch accent, right? 
Uh, but anyways, now the question becomes, what are these traditions to this holiday gonna be? Which ones win out? What's it gonna look like, right? Well, luckily, it, a lot of the art and writers and, and, and uh, of the time helped to kind of create those things for the holiday. Now you may be asking, but Tom, Tom, wait, wait. Who are those writers? What are some of those traditions? Well, first of all, don't ever interrupt me again, okay? Second of all, why don't we go to the next stop and find out? Okay, so now I'm at the corner of 17th and Irving, right near Union Square, actually, where there's like a little Christmas market where you can, uh, you know, buy some semi-overpriced stuff and see some cool people and interesting weirdos and all kinds of stuff. You can actually learn more about Union Square in the video I did about Union Square. Yeah, there you go. But I'm actually at the corner because this is where the location of the Washington Irving House is located. Uh, what's interesting about this house is that this isn't actually where he lived. Uh, before you guys get ready to keyboard it up and tell me that's the case, I'll tell you first, this is actually not where he lived. Uh, some people who lived in this house later actually started kind of the rumor that it was his house. New York Times covered it, all that stuff, and eventually they put a plaque out there, which is kind of funny, kind of makes it the perfect house because there's nothing more American than misleading history and nothing more New York than self-promotion, baby. So this is kind of makes it a perfect little place. But I bring it, you guys here to talk about Washington Irving himself. So Washington Irving was a very important New York author. He wrote uh, Legend of Sleepy Hollow. He wrote Rip Van Winkle. Uh, he coined the term Gotham. He coined the term Knickerbocker. In fact, he wrote a book called The History of New York. And in this book, he talked about uh, Sinterklaas, Sinterklaas, and how he used to ride a wagon in the air. He'd go down chimneys. He added these kind of things and, and this kind of like mystique to the guy. Uh, and later on, in another book, The Sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon. Yeah, Jeffrey Crayon. I know what you're thinking. What's his mother's maiden name? Highlighter? <laughs> uh, okay, well, in that book, actually, there was uh, the story of Rip Van Winkle, but also a few stories about uh, Christmas. He talked about how it was a holiday for kind of slowing down and being with family and warmth and jolliness. And so he added a lot of the kind of mystique to the idea of Christmas uh, and started melding these holidays together. And guess who was one of his biggest fans? Charles Dickens, baby, good old Chuck Dick. And he's the guy who wrote Christmas Carol, one of the most important Christmas stories of all time. So it's kind of interesting how these ideas kind of spread out. But Washington Irving was not the only New York author who had a big role in kind of promulgating the legend of Christmas, right? Why don't we find out who the next one is, huh? <laughs> Pretty cool effect, right? Yeah, I'm really good at this. Anyways, this brings us to our next artist that I was going to talk about. I'm sitting in front of number 444 West 22nd Street in Chelsea. And this is actually one of the homes that was owned by a man named Clement Clark Moore. Now, his dad, Benjamin Moore, actually was the owner of this huge area that he named Chelsea after a hospital uh, in uh, London. Uh, cool, this little fun fact, Benjamin Moore actually was, uh, he officiated during uh, Washington's inauguration here in New York in 1789. And he also read the last rites to Alexander Hamilton. Ah, go figure. But I'm talking about his son, Clement Clark Moore, who helped develop this area. He had a bunch of houses in the neighborhood. But more importantly, in 1823, he published a, a poem known as A Visit from St. Nicholas. Yeah, A Visit from St. Nicholas. It's the one that goes, uh, "'Twas the night before Christmas and all through the house. Not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse." That one, which you already know doesn't take place in New York City because there was no mice in the uh, apartment there. You know, everyone in New York has mice. Right, Eric? Everyone. Okay, cool. Uh, anyways, uh, that whole poem was super, super popular. It, it spread all over, people were reading it all over, and because of that, it spread a lot of the traditions and different things that were uh, promulgated for, uh, for Christmas. Yeah, people don't give a <laughs> They're just like, oh, whatever, man, you film this up, I don't give a crap. But what's interesting is that it, it, it spread things like, for example, the reindeer, the eight reindeer. Uh, also, by the way, we are in Chelsea, it's like a fancier neighborhood, so people were just like, yeah, dude, you know. I'm better than you. I'm just gonna walk right through thing. Not to be bitter, <laughs> he had to listen to me, he doesn't let me ramble. But it, he talked about the eight reindeer. He also tied the idea of St. Nicholas and gift giving to Christmas a little more tightly, which hadn't been done before. Uh, so it's kind of interesting how uh, things like that, so popular, it, it spread all over, that uh, once again, kind of starts slowly developing the singular holiday. Uh, so it's over time that this kind of thing happens. Um, interestingly enough, another artist, we'll talk about it right here, I'm not gonna bounce to another place, 
Uh, by the way, the person who just cut through the entire thing, he turned around and went the other way. So he just kind of cut through the whole thing for nothing. Anywho, what's that? Only once, though. Yeah, only once. He, well, he walked by, he went around, and he came back, and then he started going back the other way. Uh, that's true. He could, I guess, just cut right back through the same thing. Um, I think he might have heard us talking about him. <laughs> you know, it's the power of media. Uh, but anyways, uh, yeah, the other artist I wanted to mention who also had a very huge hand, another New Yorker, was named Thomas Nass. Now, he was an illustrator. Now, remember, in the 1800s, mid-1800s, and all that in New York, uh, <clears throat> not everyone could read. You had, like, the five points. You had lots of immigrants, all that kind of stuff. So illustrations were very important. This guy named Thomas Nast did a lot through the political cartoon. He actually helped bring down William Boss Tweed. But he also did a lot to spread this image of Santa Claus, huh? who, by the way, was, was known as Sinterklaas before. Sinterklaas? He was also known as Saint I Claus, Saint A Claus, like it was all these different things until it settled on Santa Claus. But he helped promote the jolly fat image. He drew him like 33 times or something. He actually started drawing him uh, to help boost the morale of the Union Army during the Civil War. Uh, he, he drew him visiting the troops, actually, um, which is kind of interesting. So he helped kind of promote this, uh, this kind of image of Santa Claus as well. Uh, and also keep, keep in mind that there were also traditions from Christmas, not it's, uh, the Feast of St. Nicholas, which also kind of tied in slowly over time, like the tree, the Christmas tree, actually is something that dates back as well. Uh, it was a German thing to actually have lights on the tree as well. We'll talk about that a little later. But uh, it's interesting how artists and different ways that you depict these things, especially in a time uh, when that's kind of what everyone looks at. You know, there's no social media. I mean, think about like the, 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 the pictures that Thomas Nash drew with just a cartoon and a few words. That's kind of like today's memes, you know, uh, except people aren't, you know, scrolling through them on the toilet. I guess they were, you know, people read Harper's Weekly on the toilet. <sighs> all right, I'm rambling now. Uh, look, so we talk about how, first of all, it started out as a Dutch. Uh, Feast of St. Nicholas with the uh, Christian holiday of Christmas. They so, slowly start melding together. Christmas also had uh, its roots. Uh, also, it, it actually took over another holiday celebrating the winter solstice. They kind of tried to replace it. All of this starts slowly starting to melt together. And then you have the artist kind of, uh, you know, spreading out and, uh, and, and, and putting out all these different ideas and traditions with it. So why don't we talk about the next thing, even more important here in New York and in the United States, Commercialism, baby. Let's go to the next stop. All right, so we're at the next stop, guys. So we've covered the raw materials of Christmas as uh, you know, the Feast of St. Nicholas and, and Christmas in the early colonies. Then we covered the artists of Christmas, the chefs who took those raw materials and started creating something. Well, now we are heading to the oven, the stove of Christmas that's gonna bake this into a holiday and that stove is commercialism, baby. We are right here next to Macy's. Now Macy's has been here since 1902. It actually dates further back. R.H. Uh, Macy, actually the star of Macy's, Supposedly is based on a tattoo he had on his hand that he got while on whaling expeditions. Pretty cool fact, right, Eric? All right, well, anyways, this is where um, kind of the, the legend of Christmas was attached to money, baby. Because remember, the, in the middle of the 1800s, this is after Clement Clark Moore and Washington Irving, comes the Industrial Revolution. You know, the, uh, money is, is, is king, baby. Industry takes hold, mass production, people, a, a, a burgeoning middle class, this all starts to create people having disposable income, being able to buy gifts. There are department stores and all these things that take off around that time. So uh, Christmas is used as kind of a way to sell these different things. You're buying gifts? Well, buy this gift, buy this gift, buy this gift. And part of that was things like Macy's starting to, one, have window displays. In the 1870s, they started putting window displays out. In fact, one of the earliest window displays here at Macy's was porcelain figures representing scenes from Uncle Tom's Cabin. Yeah because nothing says the holidays like human bondage. And that's what they did here. But they developed and they evolved. And you know, today they're very intricate and other stores have borrowed it. Another thing that Macy's has done is they started in 1924, the, uh, what today is the Thanksgiving Day Parade. It actually started out as a Christmas parade and eventually just became a post Thanksgiving thing. But it started here in 1924. In fact, they used to use live animals. But after a few years, they realized that's kind of probably not the best idea. They hired this guy, Anthony Sarg, to uh, develop balloons. He was an artist, a puppet, puppeteer. And the balloons are now kind of the, you know, the, uh, the whole uh, tradition. 
And that still goes on today. And all these things are to kind of whip up people into a frenzy. And remember, that, that parade's been going on. They used to broadcast it on the radio. Then they broadcast it on live TV in the 1950s. So this is how it all spread out. Remember, this is before social media. This is before all those websites you kids use, like LinkedIn and MySpace, right? I don't know what you kids are doing on those things, but this is very important. This helped kind of spread the idea of Christmas, get it to everybody, right? And it was a certain, you know, kind of depiction of it. Then you have in like the 1930s, you have Coca-Cola starts uh, an ad campaign using Santas. Things like the Salvation Army in the 1890s start using Santas to raise money. All of these things combine together to spread this common idea of what is Christmas. But commercialism had the money and the power and everything behind it to make it just cast a huge shadow all over the world. So it's interesting how that kind of took these ideas created by certain authors and, and legend, etc., and it just, you know, just shot them all over the place. Interesting fact too, Macy's was going to be the setting of the movie Elf, by the way. You know that? The movie with Will Ferrell? What was happened was there was a scene in the movie where, uh, where Will Ferrell rips the beard off of uh, Santa and Macy's said that they didn't want that scene in because their Santa's the real Santa. I don't know, they're kind of, kind of psychos in the front office, I guess, but John Favreau said he wouldn't take that out, so they uh, ended up having to not use Macy's. Kind of crazy. And they used Gimbal's instead, which was an old uh, competitor of Macy's. Kind of interesting, but uh, you guys may be doubting, you're like thinking, oh, what the, what is, what's the big deal about store windows, all that stuff? Like I said, this is before social media, all that stuff. There was a magazine dedicated to window displays. L. Frank Baum, who actually wrote Wizard of Oz, he had a magazine dedicated to window displays that actually gave awards out. What a simpler time, huh? What a simple, beautiful time. Anyways, I went through these things. Now today we're gonna go to the ghost of Christmas present. We're gonna move to what is today kind of the symbol of Christmas here in New York at our last stop. What do you think, Eric? Should we get the hell out of here? I, I don't think there's anything less Christmas than saying let's get the hell out of here, but uh, let's do it anyway. All right, well, I'm here at our last stop, guys. I figured since it is Christmas, what better place to end the video than at the uh, seventh circle of hell? Uh, this is right next to the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. Yay! I'm in Rockefeller Center here in Midtown. It's packed. Uh, you know, lots of, lots of tourists and stuff. But this is interesting because it combines the old Christian tradition here of trees, of the Christmas side, with all the commercialism and the Santa Claus and all that stuff. It's all kind of one big mess, right? Well, this is where the symbol of present day Christmas is located here in you know, Fifth Avenue with all the fancy stores and their window displays, and here at Rockefeller Center with its tree. The, the actual tradition at Rockefeller Center dates back to 1931 They were when they were building this 14-building uh, complex, and uh, it was to keep the morale of the construction workers up when uh, the Great Depression was kind of in full swing. The actual, the actual first public Christmas tree in New York City was uh, in 1912 in Madison Square Park. Uh, but 1931, first one, it becomes a tradition by 1933, 1934, the uh, Radio City Music Hall, which is right here. Radio City was the nickname for Rockefeller Center because NBC, uh, RCA, they were a center of all the radio in the country. Uh, ah, there's a little fact for you. Anyways, uh, the, the Christmas Spectacular started in 1934, still goes on today uh, with the Rockettes. You guys may know that. They actually got the name from uh, Roxy Rothafel, who... Uh, who actually was the guy who was in charge of uh, uh, Radio City Music Hall. Roxy Rothfeld is like one of the most famous people in the country. He, he, was, uh, he was pretty much like on all the radio shows and everything. He's kind of like uh, Joe Rogan, I guess, <laughs> back then. Uh, I guess I could see some similarities. Anyways, uh, it's still going on today. That's where this is going on. You have Fifth Avenue all the way down there. You can see all the people in the tree, which by the way, the tree tradition for Christmas dates way back. We're talking back to like the winter solstice celebrations, like Satur Saturnalia is what it was called, the Romans. Yeah, thank you very much, Eric. That's what the Romans used to celebrate. They used to use trees, different types of trees, the pine tree being one of them. Uh, because it was the winter solstice, it was a switching of like the seasons, uh, you know, like the fertility of, of new plants coming up. So there were pine trees, there were palm fronds, all kinds of things. But trees were always a big thing. And in fact, the Germans are credited with, with starting to light them. In fact, they think Martin Luther himself actually came with the idea of putting lights. They used candles, which is a horrible idea to put on a pine tree. But, uh, you know, they put candles on the trees uh, in Germany. Uh, and then they used electricity, actually. Uh, one of uh, Thomas Edison's actual uh, 
uh, partners uh, came up with the idea of putting bulbs on the trees. He actually ordered 80 bulbs to put onto a tree. It became a thing by the early 1900s. Presidents of the United States were doing it. Big thing. Kind of interesting how that happens. Uh, but you can see that it's also been kind of co-opted. Uh, Christmas is no longer as much of a, well, there is obviously the Christian celebration of Christmas, but it's also become bigger than just the Christian religion. Uh, you know, evidenced by the fact that, you know, people who aren't religious celebrate Christmas, but also the fact that like, uh, I don't know, Irving Berlin, a, uh, a Jew, he wrote the song White Christmas. Uh, you know, uh, Jewish, two Jewish guys wrote, wrote the song Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I mean, come on, <laughs> you can't get, I don't know. Anyways, uh, I don't know if you guys know the song White Christmas. You know that song, Eric? I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, just like the ones I used to know. That was pretty good, right? Amazing. Thank you so much. You know, by the way, a little trivia. That is the number one selling single of all time. Did you know that? Wow. Well, now you do. Next time you're in a bar room trivia and they ask what the number one selling single of all time is, it's not Thriller, it's not Welcome to the Jungle, it's White Christmas. And you are welcome because you are going to remember this freaking face. Sorry, that's not the spirit of Christmas. All right, anywho, we are here in, uh, like I said, on Fifth Avenue. There's all the stores here, you can go shopping. It's very pricey here, so, you know, if you got 600 bucks, you know, go buy a, a tie clip for your dad and there's your Christmas shopping season over. But, uh, you know, this is kind of where Christmas, the ghost of Christmas present in New York kind of resides. But let's recap, okay? So old school, the colonial days of New Amsterdam and New York, you had these two holidays that kind of slowly started to blend together. Uh, then you had the American Revolution and the post-independence. Uh, you had this kind of like pulling away from the British tradition uh, and more embracing things like the St. Nicholas and that side of these, uh, you know, these, uh, these traditions. But you also kind of had the bleeding of the Christmas season into those traditions. Then you had these writers come along in the first half of the 1800s, Washington Irving. You had... Uh, you had uh, Clement Clark Moore, then you had Thomas Nass later on, all giving these and, and highlighting certain traditions and making them more popular. And those were the things that everyone was reading back at the time. And then you have the commercialism of the late 1800s, early 1900s, and today. Hey, let's not forget the commercialism of today. And it all kind of bled in and created this one big holiday known as Christmas that's been beamed out to the world through movies like Elf and through all those classic hits uh, like, you know, uh, Jingle All the Way and uh, the Santa Claus 3, the Escape Clause. You know, all of those classics. Uh, so that's how the, the idea of this singular Christmas has been spread. But a lot of it was kind of fleshed out here in New York. I tried to be as clear as I can. You guys may go, uh, you know, all you keyboard warriors, all you, you know, PhDs are gonna hit your keyboards and start trying to crack. Look, I'm trying to cover this in 20 minutes. Chill out, all right? This is a pretty good little, you know, summary. If you guys want any more information, go read a damn book. Uh, sorry, I'm a real Scrooge over here. Uh, all right, I gotta get moving. Anyways, before we end, please guys, uh, check out the Patreon, help fund these things. We're trying to keep it crisp, baby. Look at this quality. We're also trying to keep it growing, keep traveling around the uh, good old world and uh, you know, all that stuff. Uh, and also to uh, subscribe, that's a big help. And uh, like the video, give it a little thumbs up. We got a lot of stuff we wanna do. And, uh, you know, how, what'd you think, Eric? Was that pretty interesting? I thought that was a pretty good one, huh? Yeah, and we didn't get trampled. And we didn't get trampled, luckily. But, you know, the evening is young. <laughs> Who knows with all these people? I can, uh, you know, a lot of people carrying around their pumpkin spice lattes and all the, you know, fake, fake Buddhist monks running around here. You never know what's gonna happen. All right, well, that's pretty much it. I think, uh, you know, I think I'm gonna go walk around. We're at NBC, so maybe I'll pop in and see if I can, you know, get a job at, uh, you know, as the host of the Tonight Show or something, and uh, we'll uh, we'll call it uh, we'll call it a night. All right, that's it. See y'all later. Tick.